This is the PowerShell Podcast. The podcast for PowerShell and the PowerShell community. You might just learn something. I think you'll enjoy it. The PowerShell Podcast is a PDQ production. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the PowerShell Podcast. I'm host Jordan with Andrew with the Garbage Internet Plaw. That's me. Yeah, Thanks, we're, Florida. We're going we're gonna to see if this works out, but you are freezing a lot uh, in, our, in our trial start here. You know, and I'm really warm in person, so it's a nice juxtaposition to get us started off here. Well put. All right. En- enough enough log. Let's get into the what's happening in the community. What's happening, man? Well, we've got some people writing new, new blog posts. You love to see it. We talk about that a lot. Um, who do we have today? We got Emil Larson friend of the podcast. We see him a lot on socials, giving us that love. And he wrote his first blog post. No, not no, he has been going for a while. He wrote his first, he, he stopped oh. for a while, but he's back. He started again. Yeah. Yes. He wrote an awesome blog post of something that I think is super relevant to discussions we've had on the podcast, which is contributing to the PowerShell blog, community blog. All right. And then Christian Ritter. I think I think he really did write his first blog post. Yep. He got started blogging. Again, friend of the podcast. Love that guy. Um, and yeah, we'll have links to both of their blogs in the show notes. Check them out. Give some support to our friends. All right. All right. That's, all right. And so also Summit. Oh, Summit's yeah. We got a big Summit coming up. And I think you can still get tickets until April 7th, right? You can get tickets after 7th, but then you're paying full price for the hotel. Right now they have blocks of rooms set aside for summit so up until april 7th 2023 just in case anyone's listening next year uh you you can book rooms at a bit of a discount uh but after that you're paying full price if there are rooms even available nice so so before seventh if you're up wanting to go is probably a good cutoff awesome so check out uh the show notes for a link directly to that and one more thing jordan All you right. know gainesville florida you know the PowerShell user group out of Gainesville? Well, we have a very special guest at our next user group on April 5th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We have none other than friend of the podcast, Doug Fink, to talk about PowerShell I and chat GPT at the command line. Link to that if you would like to join us. Jordan, I think you'll be stopping by for a little bit. And uh, we're really excited to have Doug. Absolutely. Now, who do we have today? We have a very special guest, a friend of mine. Um, I'm not sure if you've met him before. This might be your first time talking to him, but I am very excited for who we have today. It is, yeah, it's Dave Carroll, who I'm pretty sure shaved his beard so I wouldn't feel inadequate. Welcome on, Dave. <laughs> hey, good to be here. All right. So, Andrew, I remember at Summit a year ago, he was talking about all the collaboration you guys done working together and you guys took it to the next level where you're doing a, a talk at summit together. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's the, um, gosh, what, what I call it. Uh, your you code doing? is flawless, but how you doing? Kind of like the Joey Tribbiani thing. So, uh, yeah. Um, the last few years has been, you know, exceedingly difficult on my mental health and, um, I've done some, you know, self-discovery and uh, things like that. So, um, and and mental health is one of the things, it's a stigma, right? I mean, no one wants to talk about it because if you talk about it, you're vulnerable. If you're vulnerable, you're you're seen as weak. Um, but that's, that's not really how it is. I mean, I think the more you talk about yourself and your feelings and you can get, you know, connected to your feelings, the, the stronger you'll actually be. Amen. Yeah, I feel like uh, understanding mental health has made a lot of leaps and bounds recently, and it gives more tools to be able to have an outlet for when things are difficult. Definitely. It's been nice to see organizations slowly get with it um, and understand the value of these things and how creating a place that is um, psychologically safe is important for productivity and just it's the type of thing that you want to be offering your employees. Um, so they can do their best work and to do your best work, you have to be oftentimes healthy when it comes to mental health. It can be really hard to thrive in some areas when you're really suffering in other areas. Yeah, yeah you have to be, you have to have that safety. Like you said, <clears throat> if you don't have the safety, you're not going to make, uh, you know, potentially the, the great strides you need to make because you're going to be risk adverse, right? 
I mean, because you don't want to do something and then, um, you know, either get written up or or even fired outright in, in some places because you did something and it failed. So I took it a different route. Instead of trying to improve, I've just been wallowing in self-hate for so long that it just become comfortable. Like at this point, it's just, you know, it's just easy to coast on through. We, we all have our comfort zone. I mean, seriously. Uh, and and sometimes it takes a while to realize that, you know, maybe that comfort zone isn't the best for me, right? It's it's sort of like uh, the uh, Dante's Peak where they were talking about the frog. Uh, if if you're stressed or you're, you become accustomed to how things are over a long period of time, you know, they said basically it's how you make frog soup. But if you were, if you yourself was put directly into your position now, you're going to say, holy crap, what is this? This is, I can't accept this. This is intolerable. So, um, you know, it, it's all about perspective and, and about uh, point in time. Challenging stuff, though. You know, these are like struggles and things to be working on and to be looking at and re-looking at as we change and go through life and jobs and all kinds of changes. So I think to highlight what you said earlier, it is really important to have these discussions and to bring up mental health and have the psychological safety. Because what I found at, at a lot of organizations is they are all about honesty, right? They expect you to say things and admit when you're wrong and ask questions. Um, and unless that's paired with a bit of psychological safety, I think it's like kind of empty. So I think that's where culture plays a big role in things and management and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have a, um, a friend in, in California I used to work with. He's uh, like a .NET architect. And uh, he got me onto the, uh, was it the restroom topology of organizations? And there's basically like three different tiers. There's a, um, I, I forget, uh, bureaucratic something and I forget the three tiers but the the main tier that that really you want to get to where there is psychological safety is the generative tier and you know uh, experimentation is is encouraged um, you know failure is expected you know then how do you learn from that um, yeah so it, it, it's it's important to have that safety and um, you can't you're not going to get it everywhere. Somewhere, you know, the places are incredibly toxic. Yep. Now, we talked at a virtual PowerShell conference a couple of years ago. I was in one of the meeting rooms, and I remember we came. you came by and we chatted for a long time. And one of the things that I observed about you, which was pretty cool, was your ability to set boundaries with people. And if people were communicating in a way that wasn't productive, you had a really good way of approaching them. Because what I've seen a lot of times in society and, and the world that I kind of live in is when people don't like something, they'll kind of just be silent about it and then just never talk to the person again or just kind of allow them to keep maybe conducting themselves in a less than productive way. Yeah, I, I think the, the first thing before you can make any change is notify or know what your triggers are, know what know how to recognize dangerous situations um, and, uh, you know, danger to your mental health or, or whatever, or even, you know, physical health. Um, you know, virtually, obviously, I was not in any physical danger, um, but my mental health was. It's like the um, the conversation with, with the person was, um, you know, in the first 10 minutes was very taxing. And based on how my mindset works and my my history um having someone basically you know tell me exactly what to do and i'm not doing it fast enough and you know all of a sudden this imposter syndrome comes in and, and you know chokes me out basically it's like no no I, I i can't do this um and and i i basically just said you know look i i can't carry on this conversation the way it's happening now um, we need to, you know, let, let's take a step back. Let's talk about how we're talking to each other and then let's move on. And we did. And it was like another hour, I think, that we were on the on the, uh, you know, in, in the conversation. Yeah. 
that's such an awesome thing because otherwise it could have, you know, you allowed there, you kind of, I guess, assumed good intention and allowed there to be a bit of a discussion and say, hey, this isn't really working out for me. Can we try maybe changing this so that I'm not feeling this way or not getting this type of interaction? Um, and I can really relate to that because learning how to have those conversations, one, you're protecting yourself and setting yourself up for success, which is great. But two, you may be providing someone with a really good opportunity to get feedback that they don't get in other parts of life, right? Because from what I see, at least so often people are allowed to not get any kind of feedback uh, from others. And I'll, I'll give a simpler example that recently happened in my life where I got to set a little bit of a boundary to set myself up for more success. And I was playing pickleball. So I had a partner who I didn't know that well, but he kept every single time I would make a mistake, he would tell me like, oh, make sure you don't do that. And eventually I just said, hey, I really appreciate the tips, but every single time I make a mistake, you don't need to uh, give me correction. It's just an error. And boom, I didn't get any more of those kind of nags from him. We had great games. We still were friends and all that kind of thing. But it's just a little bit can go such a long way. Um, and for me to be able to start setting boundaries has been a bit of a new thing I've done in the past few years that really, um, really helps save my energy. Yeah, it's about protecting, protecting what you have, you know, whether it's, um, you know, stability, uh, financial stability, emotional stability, um, family, pets, any, you know, whatever you need to protect. Um, and yeah, uh, setting boundaries is, is, it's a skill, I guess. Um, and it's a skill that I have not, you know, uh, exercised that often. So it's, you know, it's got a lot of pounds to lose. Same here, man. When it comes to emotional intelligence, it is like a strength or like a muscle you kind of need to work out. You need to, you know, we need to learn more about ourselves and then like, oh, hey, I work best in this environment. Now I need to learn how to change my environment or work with what I'm given and, you know. It's like you said earlier, it's important to have these conversations because we're all working on different stuff at the same time. No one has it all figured out. That's one thing I've realized doing this podcast. No one has it all figured out. We're all trying. We're all at different stages in different ways. And, you know, collectively, we can get a lot more done and find a lot of psychological safety in community. Now, I, I love this talk, but I want to bring up your other summit talk because you have one on emotional intelligence type stuff, but you also have one on an amazing module um, that you put a lot of time into. And, and what's that talk about with Bluebird PS? Yeah, so, um, you know, I presented a few times on Bluebird PS, uh, you know, about how how we got started and about, you know, individual pieces, um, the framework that I built into it. And uh, the, the talk at Summit is uh, going to be Essentially, how you um, how you create and then provide the care and feeding for a public module. Now, it's not it's not a module like you know uh, DBA tools or um, you know uh, some of the others that some of your other guests have mentioned that that gets wide wide use. Uh, I think it's maybe a little over two thousand or close to two thousand downloads. Um, I think a lot of that maybe is because of uh, Chrissy Lemaire's, um, uh, her GitHub actions that use it to essentially uh, harvest Mastodon reference, uh, account references from, from Twitter. And that, that's like the, main, like the main thing that I've added to it uh, recently. And, you know, just, um, and just one person the the uh, imagining of hey I need to put these things together I want to maybe do this and it all kind of started from me wanting to write a um, how to article like on another um, uh, Twitter client but the the other Twitter client was not very PowerShelly it, it didn't really follow the the verb noun um and things like that so i basically wanted to write something that was uh more uh powershell like and and definitely powershell but um and something that was that followed best practices awesome so your talk is about the twitter module bluebird ps and how you went about kind of setting it up for success as a important module that people may use and 
all the things kind of related to that, which I think is a pretty challenging place for a lot of people, right? To go from having a module that, hey, you know, I can import it on my machine and, you know, technically it's a PSM one and a PSD one. And then going from the point where it's like, okay, I'm going to put this on GitHub for everyone to see. And then I'm going to put it on GitHub for everyone to see and publish it as a tool that I would like to be reliable. Um, yeah, I'm excited for that talk. So I know you mentioned earlier about uh, Chris Lemaire that did the GitHub Actions, and I noticed you have a blog out there where you broke down how to use your account to find out uh, the Mastodon instances your followers are in. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting. So it's a good way to find out. We don't have to go maybe hunt them down quite so much uh, if, if you're oh, yeah. looking to hop on to Mastodon. Yeah, um, you know, and and there's been a huge exodus to Mastodon. In fact, I think that's what Chrissy's uh, GitHub action is called, um, Exodus or something like that. It's it's in the name. <clears throat> um, but um, yeah, you know, things things change, and sometimes things aren't what you want to be, or, or they're they're not the they don't provide the environment that you want to to continue to continue to stay in you know whether it's whether it's on a social media site or you know in your in your home life um, or work life and and it's important to know when you know know when to to pack up and and leave or know when to you know get a house in the country and then go live there but then come time, sometimes come back and visit the the city which, and that's kind of what I'm doing. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not that active on Twitter anymore. Uh, I still get, I still go there and I still, you know, do uh, some retweets and uh, maybe a few, um, you know, comments, replies, things like that. Uh, but I don't, I don't, you know, get on it every day. Uh, but that's probably, I, I don't have the app installed. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I have a question about your career, though, because I know you have a bit more experience than I do. Could you briefly go over, you know, the first couple of years, maybe years until you found PowerShell, where PowerShell found you and how you leveraged that to be where you are today? Sure. <clears throat> so there was making sandwiches. I was a sandwich artist at Subway. Um, and this is like the first part of my IT um, it was just kind of, sounds kind of weird, but, um, our register needed a new overlay because we had used it so much. You couldn't read the, the sandwich names and things like that. This was an older register, obviously back in like, 91. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, or actually it was 91, 93. Anyway, uh, so I went and, um, uh, to a local, uh, print shop and they said, well, there's a computer over there. If you you know know how to work it, I'll print whatever you know. I'll I'll, I'll basically do the type. I did the typesetting, and the guy did the printing of it. <clears throat> um, and then I realized the fast food stress is is like an immediate you know knock you in your face you know knock you knock you back down stress uh, when you've got you know a line of fifty people and everyone called out and you're the only one making sandwiches. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so I, I ended up saying, you know, look, I'm going to put in my two weeks and I'm going to start looking for a job. And um, I, I heard about a, uh, this guy that was leaving a uh, computer store, a little mom and pop shop. And I went, I interviewed and, and um, I told the guy, he's like, look, I've already put in my two weeks. He says, well, what if I don't hire you? You know, what are you going to do then? Well, I mean, I'll get a job with a temp company or something like that. And, uh, you know, I would really like to be in, you know, doing computer work. Um, and I didn't know anything about hardware. I was maybe okay with, you know, Windows and DOS, stuff like that. Um, and he hired me. And then, like, within three months, I was a service manager. <clears throat> yes. um, this was before we had um, a lot of books. Like, mm -hmm. if you wanted to learn how Windows worked, that was a resource kit that was that was like you know the size of a you know uh, maybe a Nashville phone book or something like that <clears throat> and um, so yeah I, I started doing that stuff and uh, went through um, I started at a 
uh, engineering firm. I was there for about nine months, uh, did some access work there, went from there back to the computer store because there was a, a crash and a stock market crash, I guess. And the uh, company that I was working for, they said, oh, we need to get rid of a lot of people. Uh, it went from like 80 something people down to 30 people within that nine months. <clears throat> And I was the one that mostly went by and, and picked up all their uh, systems and things like that, you know, did the inventory. Um, then I started a job at, at a community college and I loved it. Uh, I was uh, started mostly in uh, endpoints like printers, you know, probably 300 printers on a campus, um, 11, 1200 workstations. You know, some of them were still connected with coax. Yeah, that's that's the kind of years that we were in. Um, and I, I was there for like 13 years. And at one point I was the webmaster, like redesigned the, the website, have everything like with one template. And then I got to be the systems admin. And uh, that's kind of where, that's where I started with PowerShell. See, I finally pulled it in to, into PowerShell. Um, and um, we were essentially forced to use, uh, maybe force is a strong word, um, in order to provide student email, there was a new thing called Live at EDU, which happens to be the ancient word or name of Exchange Online. <clears throat> um, so it was actually, you know, straight up exchange, you know, we were exchange five five shop i think that we went uh maybe what 2003 or something and about that time well a little after that is when we uh, started doing the exchange stuff and i'd already written like this uh identity management uh solution and db script and now I have to incorporate this you know all the essential exchange uh commands things like that powershell right so i thought I i'm you know, I need to really learn PowerShell. And this is about 2009. So I spent, you know, better part of a couple of weeks in convert, converting, I guess it was, you know, like over 10,000 lines of EB script, maybe more into, you know, straight into uh, PowerShell. And um, everything worked great. I, I had um, other colleges that was in the, the state system. They, they asked me for, you know, my code and stuff like that. And, um, so I'm also, when it comes to programming languages, I'm kind of multi, I'm multi-linguist. Um, one of the things that I wrote was in Power, uh, PHP and MySQL backend and Oracle and all this other stuff. And I think the PHP front end is still actually in use. Um, and it's like 13 years old. Oh. So it's like, man, that's, that's something. So. Um, but it was, you know, simple in what it did and, you know, of course it looks different, but like all the, all the, the, the forms are still there and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, because of exchange and, and I'm glad that exchange, the exchange team adopted PowerShell because that's probably was the, the reason why we have PowerShell now. Um, yep. yeah, that was the first application where. There, there started to be things that you couldn't do within it without knowing some PowerShell. Yeah. Nice. So, Dave, you're pretty OG. You've been, here, been around for a while, man, in the PowerShell yeah. world. Yeah. My, um, um, in, I think, 2010, I had my – so I, I presented off and on um, when I was in the, the, the school system, and um, I'm – I looked at some of my slide slide deck from previous presentations, and I know, like in 2010, I had PowerShell code in in a presentation then. <clears throat> so that was kind of cool. Um, you know, my first presentation was like 13 years ago, something like that. Um, yeah. Nice. And over the past few years, it feels like you've grown a lot as a person kind of thing like there's been this transformative process has powershell and your experiences and growing in that and the community played a role in that at all or <clears throat> um 
Yeah, so so the PowerShell community is one of the most welcoming communities that I've been part of. Um, and I I really am grateful for that. And um, the, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel, <clears throat> I feel welcomed. I mean, it's kind of hard to say anything better than that. Um, and gosh, what, what a, I'm stuck here. Uh, it is for me, at least, you know, it's been interesting to be part of a community that is so welcoming for the first time ever. I'm like, whoa, this is really cool. And everyone practices what they preach all the way up to our leadership, right? We've mentioned this a couple of times where you have Jeffrey Snover on stage making mistakes, just being a person, someone who so many people view as like the rock star type. And you're like, oh, wow, I make mistakes just it, like that. It wasn't even just he makes mistakes. Is he made a point of it during his opening talk in last year's summit that everybody makes mistakes and it's okay and then like he like he made oh, yeah. a point of his focus that it was okay which is instead of just making a mistake he he reassured with the two i thought that was a pretty cool talk it just shows wisdom right because that is the truth i think you kind of talked about that before it's like when you have the psychological safety to make mistakes to learn to grow to try new things to have conversations it's a lot more productive it's a lot more efficient and it doesn't, you know, someone like Jeffrey Snover can certainly see that, which is cool. Yeah. And I, I, I remember the first, I've only met him once, but um, um, I guess I have a lot of movie references. I don't know if you ever watched uh, Galaxy Quest where Justin Long, his character, uh, goes up to the um, uh, Tim Allen's character and was asking him very specific questions, you know, technical questions, things like that. I kind of felt like I, I was that stupid little kid that went up to Snover and said, hey, yeah, um, by the way, I'm working on this, um, this function and I'm having a problem. Uh, it turned out that the XML filter for uh, Git Win Event, the XML has a finite length, so you couldn't keep on adding more uh, conditionals, more conditionals and stuff like that to get what you want. So um, I ended up having to like break that that XML out into separate, um, and, into multiple uh, uh, calls basically. But yeah, so, you know, he, um, um, we were actually eating, it was at a um, uh, higher ed conference uh, in, at, at Microsoft, uh, on Microsoft campus. Um, and it was, it was kind of cool to, um, to just see him, you know, in his little vest and all that stuff, you know, the little, um, uh, I don't know, fleece vest or something. And yeah, so, you know, with, with him having the, um, showing that it's okay to make mistakes, um, things like that, it, it kind of puts things sort of and the perspective it's like well if he if it's okay for him to make mistakes then maybe i can make mistakes yep and to draw back to what you said earlier about vulnerability making mistakes on a stage is vulnerability but it's also strength because you see someone leading the way and opening the door for so many behind them by modeling that behavior and that's the type of thing that we can do in our work lives we can be honest and vulnerable and lead the way for others to start maybe expressing similar sentiments or to do things in a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, what, what, okay, go ahead. Oh, no, I, just, I just was curious because what struck me as interesting is the first time you met him, you went straight into asking him highly technical questions, which I think is awesome. I wonder how often he gets something like that or how often it's just what I would be like where I'd just be falling over myself to, to, to praise all the stuff he did, but to go straight into, hey, Here's a technical question. I bet he really appreciated that because he probably doesn't get that a lot anymore. I I don't know. Um, I mean, socially awkward me. I, I I didn't really see any any issue with it, right? Um, you know, in in fact, um, I, I think he did a lightning demo there, um, but uh, you know, at, at that conference. So the uh, this whole perspective thing uh, kind of reminds me of. Uh, one of my high school teachers who uh, helped, he basically, he was, my, he was a mentor, you know, he was our you know, D&D GM for a while and uh, computer club, all that. I wanted him to help the computer club actually make a computer 
build a computer from scratch, from chip level. I had no idea what kind of ask that was for, for students at that time in a rural in uh, high school. It's like, no, that's not gonna happen. But uh, th this guy was like like a genius. Um, and and he was an electrical engineer by trade. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he helped me with, the main thing he helped me with was trying to get over my stuttering. So from like fourth grade up through, you know, 11th grade or so, I mean, I stuttered a lot. Like it would take a while for me to get the first couple of syllables out. It depends on what the syllable started with, things like that. But, you know, he, he told, told me about, you know, taught me perspective in a way that, you know, my problem is I am closest to my problem. I am closer to my problem than anyone else is, right? So to me, that problem looks like I'm standing next to a five-story building and I look up and it is huge, but everyone else, they're like a mile away and they see the problem much smaller. They don't, they don't really see the problem as large as, as I would see it, you know? And, and I think that's, that was, that really helped me that and talking fast. Uh, uh, I kind of got over the stuttering. I talk fast. Sometimes I, my train derails and don't know what the hell I'm talking about or, or where, you know, what the next topic was going to be. <laughs> Dude, you, have you listened to the podcast? Cause that's me sometimes, man, this train goes too fast and it can be good, but sometimes it's just madness. And it's like, Whoa, hold up. Let's get centered. What are we actually doing here? You know, actually, I don't listen to the podcast much. Now, wait, 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 wait. I watch it mostly, right? right. So um, I, I'm, I'm big on YouTube. I watch, you know, a lot of um, retro channels, cooking channels, um, Adam Savage Tested, who's got a lot, of, um, a lot of insight on workflow and space usage and things like that. I mean, I, I watch, I watch, his channel mostly just for that kind of learning, but um, yeah, I, I watch I watch a lot of the the podcasts there, and uh, I, I think there are some podcasts that aren't on YouTube. And I think you said mentioned that they're actually still on the the audio portion is still like in all the streaming platforms for that. Yeah. Uh, so the ones that I need to go back to, yeah. And you know, over the last week or so, I've probably watched I don't know. 12, 15 of the, the podcast at a little higher than normal speed nice. for most. <laughs> Chipmunk Andrew is what you're used to. Nice. <laughs> He's already fr frantic energy and you choose to speed that up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> it's, this whole thing. Yeah, you know, sometimes on the shill, I'll stutter and I'll make mistakes and I'll just, it, it's an interesting thing to be okay with making mistakes and just doing it a little bit. Like it's been such an adjustment because I think my instinct is like so many others, it's to just be so critical and like, you know, ah, I just didn't present my best self to everybody. That sucks. But it's the real me people. What's up? That's the uh, the uh, biggest hurdle for me. And, and Chrissy covered a lot about how she handles it, but other people make mistakes. I'm completely fine with them. Absorb it. It's not a big deal. My mistakes will haunt me forever. Yep. Yeah. And, and you keep ruminating over them too. It's like, why, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I really wish I could undo that. Where's the undo button? <clears throat> but Dave, you've probably heard us say a couple things that have been wrong, of course, right? Have you held it against us? Did it heavily offend you? Or did you just maybe accept it and just kind of, oh, whoops, keep rolling? I mean, in this particular podcast? No, just in general. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. No, but um, so I used to be real, um, I guess, throwing a, a word out, pedantic about, you know, this is the cynic structure. And when you send, send something to someone, you need to have the right cynic structure. But ultimately, that's not really what communication is about. Communication isn't about structure. It's about communicating to another human being. And, and however that can happen, the best way that can happen, you know, I, I am a lot more um, forgiving on how people pronounce, you know, tomato, tomato, whatever. I know what you're talking about. You know, it's a fruit, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, it's much more forgiving. 
So, because humans are going to make mistakes. Humans, we don't know everything. We're not an AI, right? Uh, we don't know everything. We're going to make mistakes, and we have to um, be forgiving to ourselves and to others. Well, speaking of mistakes, tomato is a fruit. So, hey, <laughs> we're we're living what we say, right? We're right here for you, people. Oh, gosh. Now, I have a question about a book that you and I both published a chapter in, PowerShell Conference Book Version 2, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about your chapter and maybe if you had a little, I think there might be a Snover tie-in in there as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, first off, 2017, I, I joined the, the community when I posted a picture of my super duper hot, still hurting uh, PowerShell tattoo on my wrist. Can you show us right so, now? Um, yeah, so that guy. Nice. Yeah, Jordan and, and I are jealous. <laughs> it's, uh, it's blue. And the, I think the next year is when they, they came out with PowerShell Core and turned it to a blank logo. It's like, now I got to get this thing filled in. But um, yeah, once I posted that, uh, Snover started following me. And then um, when I knew I was going to be writing a chapter on soft skills, I thought, you know what? It would be kind of great to have a lead in. First off, because I'm an imposter and I want to make sure that people know that you know, I'm not just some schmuck. I want to, let me try to get some. So I, I reached out to Snover and he um, he said, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to write a intro for you. And, and I use it and, and it's a great intro. Um, and in fact, I'm going to be um, republishing the that chapter in a series of like maybe three or four articles over the next month or so. That's been the plan for the last year. But um Definitely, I'm going to be doing it now. Uh, I'm in a much better state, you know, mental health state to, to be able to do that. Um, but um, yeah, so so whenever he sent me the the um, uh, his, his intro, I was watching what was happening on Twitter, and I think that was the day that he was on on route to a meeting with the Bill Gates. <laughs> it's like wait a minute, a guy that I am kind of conversing with uh, was also going to be conversing with Bill Gates. So by the transitive, I mean, that's that's almost like, hey, I was talking with Bill Gates, right? Maybe not. So there's but, mathematical uh, properties that make it a reality. Yeah, but that, that was that was kind of cool. So it's like, um, yeah, anyway, that, just, just a cool, um, my uh, claim to fame, I guess. Now you're a DevOps guy. Would you say you consider yourself a little bit of a DevOps guy? Yeah, yeah. I've I've been um, so I've been doing this a long time, and I've had I've done pretty much every kind of job in IT that you can think of. You know, pulling cable, even terminated fiber. Um, you know, the old way uh, with with the polishing of the glass and stuff like that. And um, um, over time, I started realizing, you know what? I really don't want to be out in the field doing things to endpoints. I want to like work on servers. And then I kind of got to the point where, man, these servers are a hassle. I kind of wish everything was virtual. And then that kind of led me to to this, um, you know, to, to learning about DevOps. And and it's like, wow. So I need to. I need to not think about, I don't know, the, the, the way I like doing things is just, con, you know, completely code. Code would be nice for everything. Uh, sort of like it makes it more, make, for me, it makes life a little more matrixy, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I got one job because it had you know, and DevOps was attached to it. And when I started the job, they removed the and DevOps, which was kind of kind of grabby. But uh, um, the um, I, I started learning more about DevOps, and it's more than just tool sets. It's more than just a title, right? It's more of a, a mindset. 
and um, you know it, the mindset kind of comes along with this you know generative uh, culture. This uh, psychological safety um, comes along with um, doing well, what what it's never say uh, do things in small batches and don't be a jerk, right? Uh, so that's basically the, um, the, that's what he says DevOps really boils down to. And that that's kind of it. So do small, do things in small batches, fail fast. Um, and, you know, and, and at the end of August of 2020, I finally got a job that was, that was DevOps and I had done a lot of learning, right? So I'd kind of done some prep work. I knew it was like, I, I knew how to do math, but I'm not going to be hired as a mathematician yet, right? So, so I've been hired as that, and and I'm doing like uh, infrastructure as code. Um, doing, uh, I still do uh, PowerShell, but I probably do more Python just because of the it's a the chosen language of the of the um, of the job. And um, yeah, it's it's great, and and I like I like the fact that. The only endpoint that I have to really physical endpoint that I have to deal with is my work laptop. Nice, very cool. So, I have. A, I've seen a lot of people as like I've been doing a lot more Python. It makes me think that there's a pretty easy transition between PowerShell and Python. I, I know the the language and everything is different, but it just seems to me that people that are regularly in PowerShell can adopt Python relatively quickly. Yeah, um, gosh, there was uh, there's a book, uh, Pratik maybe wrote it. Pratik, um... Yeah, it, it's it's basically a book for uh, that that shows you how to do certain things. It's sort of like a one on one, but it shows you PowerShell and Python simultaneously. PowerShell and you know, Python. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's an amazing book, and um, you know I got that. I, I read some of it and uh, mostly what I've been doing is like, you know, besides work uh, to, to push the boundary of learning Python, it's like the uh, advent of code or any code challenges, do it in both or, you know, do it in, in whatever language you want to get, you know, proficient in. And, if, and like there was one time that I did PowerShell and Python for the advent of code for the, the first few days or whatever until I got, you know, uh, unable to complete but um, it, it really helps, you know, and and I think like other people have said on on the this podcast, once you know general the general structure and conditionals and looping and things like that, it's just a matter of knowing what the syntax is, um, you know. After that, so yeah, um, I think those AI tools are going to be pretty helpful as time goes on to help with people become more polyglot focused, able to kind of move between languages and, you know, get help when they need to. And like you said, understanding the fundamentals and the basics will get you a very long way. Just yeah, gosh, that was a $5 word, polyglot. Um, yeah. Um, so really, I have been kind of, I have not jumped on the bandwagon of AI yet. And um, it was actually just this morning when I was thinking, and that's not for dramatic, you know, um, whatever it was actually this morning, I was thinking, um, you know, when I was polishing the end of the fiber optic by hand, now there's a tool that makes it much easier to do that. Then I started thinking, well, crap, that's what AI is going to do, it's going to make things easier. So, you know, I might just kind of sign up for a uh, their chat GPT soon. Hey. So on Thursday, I was using that one live on the webcast that we do, and he has a new feature called Copilot. I mean, it's mm -hmm. he used a lot based off of the GitHub Copilot, but I have that based on an 80 command, build a calculated property at the end of my command to convert the time to human readable. And it just right off the bat. So that's something, especially in AD, you get the long string for the time. I'm never going to remember how to convert it. But now I just put it in English. Hey, is the calculated co property convert that? And it it works fantastic. 
Yeah, and, and I'm assuming that with um, the Copilot, uh, eventually you'll be able to, like, as you're working in VS Code, and, and you know, you you have an object, you know, like the uh, user object or something like that from AD. It's going to automatically say, "Hey, do you want to convert this to human readable?" Uh, just click here. <laughs> yeah. So there's quite a few things. The so Copilot is more of asking a question, and it gives me an example of the code and asks me if I want to run it, which was pretty cool. But then he has another one where, he, and he has an alias for it of just GPT, mm -hmm. where you can ask more direct questions, where it will answer within the VS terminal. So it, it's already pretty close to there. The the work he's done with it, it's it's pretty fantastic right now. Yep, time's going to be kind to all these tools as well. So I, it's fun to dabble now, but I think that as time goes on, we're going to get some pretty cool, a little bit refined tools. Um, and you know what? Join us at the Canesville PowerShell user group, Dave. We'd love to say what's up with, uh, with Doug, but no pressure. Okay. I have a question about DevOps. So you were just telling us about how you were into DevOps. And to me, we were talking about the culture of the PowerShell community and how that kind of helped you with things. To me, right alongside that is the kind of DevOps culture, like the generative, the kind of growth mindset type of stuff that you see in that DevOps approach. What were some influential DevOps resources for you that kind of imparted this knowledge to you, if there are <clears> any that come to mind? I know um, Jeffrey Snover was definitely one of them. But. Yeah. Um, well, the um, uh, the same developer friend of mine that uh, that I mentioned before, um, he was the one trying to get DevOps mindset kind of to to get everyone to be shifted that way, and uh, um, at that university where I worked, um, and and of course everyone's favorite the um, uh, Phoenix Project. Uh, I've got the Unicorn Project. Have not actually read it. Um, there's um, Making Work Visible. I forget who the author is, uh, but that's also good um, because, you know, work, unplanned work is always like the detriment of uh, productivity. Um, what else? Uh, so if you do the, the pro, uh, Phoenix Project, I was kind of wanted to see what the original book that it was kind of based on, like like the structure of the book, how it was based, and and that was um, um, was it the theory of constraints. Uh, I'm asking AI, so don't worry. I'll get the answer. Yeah, yeah I'm just looking. Um, yeah, it, I think it's like maybe the, the theory of constraints with um, um, Eliyahu Goldratt, maybe. But um, yeah, yeah, he, he was. It was more of a Socratic method. And so whoever hasn't read the book, it's not going to be just a straight tech manual, and it's not. You know, it's not like. Um, yeah, it's definitely not that. It's more of a fictionalized uh, scenario, and uh, you know, you kind of get to buy into the people's plight and stuff like that. And the one guy that that they beat up so much because he's he's like the one he's the one linchpin that's holding all of the IT together and also the one main bottleneck for all the productivity. Um, yeah. But yeah, th th those are the good books. Um, trying to think if there was anything else. Uh, probably probably not. Good stuff there. Appreciate that. For me, I am just so fascinated with thinking about systems. And while I haven't had like a dedicated DevOps role, I feel like I've learned so much about how to approach problem solving generally from how DevOps approaches developing software in the most efficient way and how important communication is. And I love, my brain loves it when like a concept applies to technology and also just people, right? Um, yeah. yeah, my brain goes kind of woo whenever I hear all that stuff. So sweet. Jordan? Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready to, we're we gonna kick in some hard questions or? Well, the question is, not I ready? Is Dave ready? Because these questions, they don't get any easier. People think they're prepared for them until they're under the spotlight. Put them under the pressure here. All right, Dave, we got, uh, we got some common parameters coming at you now. What if? <laughs> 
Ooh, well, there you go. <laughs> wow, he went up to you right there, Jordan. That's one day of Jordan zero. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a score I'm very used to. Right. What is one time something went wrong on the job, uh, and what did you learn from it? Okay. Out of all of the, um, uh, the subjects in school, I'm really bad at math because this may not be three. I mean, this may not be one. Uh, um, so there was a time at the mom and pop computer store when I was working on a printer and most printers, uh, laser printers have like a print engine test button. And uh, this was a new, new model that I was working on. I looked at it and there was a PE and I like a little hole. So it's like, hmm, that must be the print engine test. So a little paper clip they pushed in and the paper clip melted because that was that stood for possible electrocution. So um, uh, I don't really know what it stands stood for, but basically it, it burned up the um, uh, probably some rectifier or whatever on the on the uh, power supply. Um, but yeah, so I learned not to do that. Uh, there was another time that um, I at the at the college I was wanting to upgrade the front page web extensions hmm, on an appliance. So if you don't know front page web extensions, that means that you're pretty young uh, or or had never had any kind of uh, web experience. But um, yeah, so I ended up toasting like half of our websites. Uh, this was individual websites and it's like, I, luckily I had a backup, so I restored it. And uh, you know, one of the first things I did was like, oh man, hey guys, I messed up bad. Um, I'm going to do my best to recover what I can. And I hope you got your own back up this stuff. But, you know, and so for me, it was like important to, to own up to the mistake. Because, uh, you know, why, why hide it? Because there was no way I could hide it. Um, Ownership's a common theme from that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got one more that's PowerShell because I want to bring in PowerShell on this. Um, so I don't know if you know about proxy addresses and Active Directory. You know, it's like it's got all of the the aliases or whatever email address aliases. Well, I learned that if you don't start your loop with a clean variable, you're going to throw some corruption in. You know, a few hundred, maybe a, a couple of thousand users sitting out there. So um, I learned to you know, no out your variables at the beginning of a loop before you start using that anywhere else. And of course, how did I fix it? PowerShell, PowerShell mess it up. PowerShell is going to fix it. Yep. You can yeah. screw up 100 computers and also fix them. That's good. As long as they're online. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do like the, the common theme of that question for almost all guests is, taking ownership of the issue because there's there's two results for that there's two outcomes either they appreciate your honesty you move on no there's no big consequence or they can't handle that this mistake was made in which case they're doing you a favor by moving you out you can go somewhere that uh a little bit better yeah nobody wants to live in a prison of lies that they've constructed <laughs> so be honest i don't know here i am and i'm still convincing people i know how to do powershell so <laughs> same don't worry <laughs> We know more than some, less than others. Right. Second common parameter. With everything you know now, what's one tip you would give your younger self when first starting out in IT? Which I'm gonna I'm gonna add a preface this. You already started out pretty bold because you put in two weeks without any sort of IT job job lined up because you knew that's what you wanted. So it seems to me like you were uh, ready to dive in. Yeah. Um so I've got maybe two or three nice nuggets of, of information. Um, the one that we've kind of already talked on before is know your boundaries. So you need to know your limit and when you need to push past that limit. Um, and know that it's okay to say no sometimes. You know, if you're, if you're a people pleaser like, like I am, because you, you need that validation, it's like, I'm not going to say no to people when they ask, and then I'm going to get so much work loaded on me, and then I'm going to feel bad because I'm missing out on stuff, you know, or, or missing deadlines on things. So um, know your limit. 
Um, and in fact, the uh, the self worth. There's a quote from from Picard. Gotta gotta have a TV quote too. Um, it self worth should come from within, not without. Uh, so that's one of the things that I never learned as a kid. Even when I probably heard that, you know, in the the early '90s, late, yeah, you know, whenever TNG was out and that that actually aired. I never really paid attention to it because they're like, ooh, you know, Star Trek and all that. But uh, now that that's there's a lot of nuggets of of truth in in TV shows like that. Um, and th the last thing that I would definitely tell myself: get into get quicker. Get because, into get. I got it. <laughs> yeah, source control is you're going to be your friend. Embrace it. Good advice. All right. Are you ready for the last of the common parameters? This one's the most difficult. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to keep it within the <laughs> the three. He's but a rule breaker. You, you set a pattern at this point. You don't want to, you don't want to break that. But what are your three favorite modules? Uh, three favorite modules that um, I like, okay, my three The two that I use the most on a daily basis is um, PS Readline because I'm, you know, I know that I've written that command before. Uh, can you help me? And being able to port, you know, I like had to reload my my uh, work my work laptop, and you know, I just copied the uh, the PS Readline history files. Like, so I just moved that history with me. That was great. Um, that and a in-house uh, module that I'm writing that um, is for, I call it AWS Utilities. Basically, it, it strings together um, multiple commands and easier to make easier commands. Like if you want to get an instance, the information on an instance for an auto-scaling group, um, you know, you can just put in like the CloudFormation stack and it'll go look up you know, the auto scaling group, it'll enumerate the instances and it'll touch each one of the instances to get more information about it. So the, I usually, sometimes I actually have that up and editing that actively as I work. So it's like, I know I'm going to need to reproduce this later. I'm going to go ahead and just keep, you know, keep this actively working. And then most of the time, you know, I don't necessarily publish it internally. Uh, good, I'm probably probably the only user of it anyway. And there's, uh, I'm, I'm on a team of like two others. So um, I don't think it's been published out to, to the others. But uh, yeah, so those are probably the two that I use daily. Now, the ones that I have used and the ones that have probably influenced a lot is um, the Active Directory module. I, I lived in that so much. And, um, you know, because I, I used to do uh, identity management all the time now i don't do that hardly at all uh actually at all uh so yeah the active directory um also uh just i guess because it maybe i'm a little lazy i like the um i like jeff hicks ps release tools um i usually use that to download like the latest and install it or whatever um and um platypus uh, all your publicly you know, publicly delivered modules needs to have documentation and Platypus makes it super easy. I mean, um, I've got two or three public modules that has public documentation and, you know, websites and it's great. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's probably modules and, and such. So I do, I do have a follow up, a fourth common parameter, if you will, you're, you're trending new territory. Where Ooh. one of your first modules was the 81, which mine was as well. How long did it take you to stop trying to use the property attribute to add additional properties in your Git commands for other modules? Um, I don't know. Kind of. I, I guess I, I I knew that that was specific to you know that you know those commands. I didn't really 
use I didn't think that the the you know property parameter was you know in in in, in the other ones um, and also you know dash tab complete I use that tons I mean uh, it's it's so helpful. You're better off than me because I tried to add property to every command I wrote for. Why well, I, I, I'm not even going to go into time for it because that'd be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, we'll just say a long time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, Dave, but Andrew Schilling is so powerful that the government is currently actively trying to take down his internet to silence his voice. But you know, even though technically there's no internet to his house right now, his message is so positive that it still managed to get out on the web. And here we are. And we get the the privilege of, of watching this this true master just spin modern art. Take it away, Andrew. Jordan, you're right. The privilege is yours. I'm just here to to do my thing. Listeners, thank you for being here. Awesome. If you're hearing us say this right now, it means you listen to the whole thing. It means you're friends with us. It means my internet is terrible. Um, if you'd like to leave us a like, comment, or subscription on YouTube, that'd be amazing. If you're listening to us on a podcast platform, leave us a review. Uh, Jordan, I would love it if people left some reviews or comments or whatever. We could maybe pick a couple of funny ones and read them out. Um, so if you are listening, please leave us something. Throw us a bone. Jordan, you're on Twitter. At DevOps Jordan. I'm at Andrew Plotek. PowerShell podcast is at PowerShell pod. And if they want to email us, send us something on the low, a little secretive maybe, PowerShell at pdq.com. Um, Dave, thanks so much for joining us, man. Uh, you're a great friend. I'm so pleased we could get you on. I know we've been looking forward to this for a while. Where can people keep up with you and say hello to the Dave Carroll? Um, well, I'm actually the Dave Carroll on almost every every platform. You see what I did there. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said before, I'm not that much on Twitter anymore, but still the Dave Carroll uh, there on GitHub, LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Mastodon, the uh, fostodon.org instance. Um, yeah, so you can do that, or you can go out to thedavecarroll.com. Um, it's important for branding, right? So branding is important. And, and uh, I, I secured that, that domain a couple of years ago. Uh, so yeah. You've made Ashley McGlone very happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, well, thank, thank, thanks um, for joining us. Yeah, this was fantastic. Uh, this, was, this was great. Uh, this should be dropping. I guess I didn't even go into the dates here. That's what we do off camera. I'm going to yeah. stop talking now so we can close Something's this dropping. It's been a great <laughs> one. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining the PowerShell podcast with your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plough. They're serious. They mean what they're saying. The PowerShell podcast is a production of PDQ.com.